Welcome to Fort Knox. Uh, I am John Fort. Happy to be here with Flexport CEO Ryan Peterson. Um, and I'm going to jump right in as I always do and just tackle off the top. Flexport is in the global logistics business, applying technology to that. So there's so many challenges these days. But what is the toughest problem that you are facing right now? Uh, well, the biggest problem hitting global logistics today is that there's more demand for container capacity to ship things than there is supply. So there's more containers that need to be moved than can fit on the world's ships. And it's actually created sort of a positive feedback cycle or a, or a negative vicious cycle where because there's so much demand, so many containers being moved, it's actually led to traffic jams at the ports uh, in particular. So it's taking so long to unload all these containers that a huge percentage of the world's container ships are stuck in a traffic jam just waiting to unload, which if you think about it, then reduces the capacity, the amount of supply of ships because they, they, only, they only make money, they only serve when they move. So they're sitting there and that's, so that's compounding the problem. You got more demand than ever, more people are buying goods than ever. At the same time, the amount of volume that can be shipped is down. Um, and it's, it's really created a crisis. You've got prices are above $10,000 a container, up to 15 or even 20,000 to ship from Asia to the US. And how does that, Long compare, to run, how does that compare to normal? That's it's like that. normally it's like 2000 is the rule of thumb. Um, so it's a huge spike in prices. Now that's the spot market. That's like assuming you didn't negotiate anything in advance. You didn't make commitments. It's a, you know bigger companies are signing more at like four or five thousand dollars a container, but still it's double double normal. Yeah. So then, what where does Flexport fit fit in? Explain the way you're trying to apply technology, apply software, um, apply uh, analytics, uh, and, and even automation to this business and. Um, and how that works. Yeah, so Flexport's a technology platform for global logistics. And, and if you think about it, what needs to happen if you're shipping one of these containers from door to door, and really what customers care about, what businesses care about is not the container, but what's inside the container, all these products that they're, that they're buying and selling. And if you wanna do that from door to door, you're gonna have as many as 15, even more companies involved. You know, you've got the importer that's buying the products, the brand, you've got the factory that's producing it, but then on the way from between those two, there's a whole chain of trucking companies in other countries, warehouses where they're going to consolidate that freight and put it in a container or put it on an airplane. Another truck that goes from that warehouse to the port, the port itself, a customs broker, a ship, like it adds up, right? And then there's a bank and an insurance company. They're kind of financing and underwriting these transactions. So, and so what get, Flexport does is bring technology to connect all these parties. You have to get all those parties to use Flexport? It's, uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, and we do, and we do. Um, so we've got user interfaces for them, for like all those different personas, all those different kinds of companies to be able to come and do what they need to do. That includes mobile app for truck drivers. We've got about 30% of US port truck truckers on our platform. So we can dispatch trucks at every port in the US and airport without human involvement now. Um, and similarly, apps for the importer, for the exporter. And a lot of cases, look, it's hard to get companies to use your software sometimes. So a lot of cases, what we do is integ integrate. And we've got this API-based platform that we can connect anybody to get data to and from whoever needs it to, to move these goods. Uh, very complex problem. And I think a part of Flexport's solution, why it's worked so well, is that we're now one of the biggest companies in shipping. We ship more containers than anybody on Asia to US. At the end of this year, we'll be the largest provider of ocean freight from Asia to the United States. So that's pretty compelling. If you're a trucking company and I, I I'll, we'll be your biggest customer, all you have to do is use this software. And by the way, the software is pretty good and it saves you money from not having to do so many emails back and forth. So it's, it's, it's a big part of our success is like the fact that we're both a logistics company and a technology company where usually these are kind of separate worlds that don't talk to each other. Huh. Yeah, and tell me how the pandemic affected um, not just the logistics business, but your business in particular. I keep hearing from CEOs in the tech space that, yeah, there was this digital transformation happening, but the pandemic really accelerated that. Was it the same thing 
in the global logistics space where people sort of paired back at first expecting that you know demand was going to slack off and then about three months into things it was like pedal to the metal uh oh we got a reverse course did that force people into more technology uh yeah and, and first off that we definitely saw that in the market is like the initial reaction i think for everybody in the world was like oh my goodness we're staring at the abyss nothing like this has ever happened before maybe we need to do layoffs or certainly let's cut our purchase orders and see what happens and so like we had it fell off a cliff uh and what are we talking like a a april of last year the, the all of a sudden we looked and people were just not placing purchase orders all the factories were shut down in china nobody was ordering any goods and then exactly as you described like come july people realize, oh my goodness, actually consumers are buying stuff and they're buying more stuff than ever. And we just spent three months not ordering anything. So then you had this like surge, this rush to go buy as much as possible. And um, the other thing that happened, so the, the brands that are buying stuff stopped uh, for a couple of months, like I just said, but ocean carriers, the companies that own the ships also looked at that and go, well, I guess we need to park our ships. And they idled a huge percentage of capacity for a couple of months, right? Rightly so, right? It's like, hey, if there's nobody shipping stuff, I don't need as many ships. Let's not just run them empty. But then when the surge came back, it takes a little time. You mothball a ship, you put it up, and then you want to get it back into the service. By the time they did that, the prices had surged for ocean freight and haven't come back down, right? And they keep going up. So that's like kind of market conditions. Flexport specifically, what we saw was so our, our technology actually makes it super easy to work from home we, we give logistics teams awesome technology to collaborate across all those parties i mentioned as well as within their own company so like the average flexport customer a, a brand that ships with us will have 55 users on our platform and it's not just the logistics teams it's your marketing team your finance team your e-com team wants to know like what's in stock what can we list on the website they, they'll hook their api to flexport to update their website in real time with where inventory is, when is it going to arrive? Uh, you got customer service teams that use us. So, so it's actually, fascinating. All this, go ahead. No, it's fascinating. Like one of the things that people say about something that you can't do immediately is, oh, it's going to take a while to turn the ship around, right? And so, and that's exactly what you're dealing with, right? So you're at the intersection of digital, which moves really fast, and container ships which by definition move really slowly totally to drive efficiency i mean um, and, and watching these things play out in real time it's like oh my god it's like how, how can we of course you're going to have these problems uh you, you know physical infrastructure doesn't scale up and down when all of a sudden imports go up 20 percent. like that's not normal you know long run historical averages that trade grows three or four percent per year you grow 20 percent it's not and, and by the way it's nobody's fault like you can't have 20 percent extra capacity of shipping sitting around unused like that's not very efficient economically um so yeah it, it's been it's been really wild to be right at the center of it and what i was saying is like what with um when people started working from home we saw a huge increase in adoption of flexports tech like daily users went through the roof because logistics teams that normally just sit next to each other and talk all of a sudden they were like, actually the mes messaging interface in our software is super useful. And we saw a real adoption of technology tools that we built. So it was, uh, that part was actually quite helpful. Like we, we, we felt like we were in a leading position because of it. That makes a lot of sense. So Flexport is not the first company even that you started. So uh, it's at the point I want to, I want to go back. Actually, I want to go way back um, to the, to the beginning of your story, literally. Um, where were you born? Uh, where'd you grow up? You know, parents, yeah. siblings. Tell me the tell me the situation. Oh, I totally. So I'm from Bethesda, Maryland, suburb of Washington D.C. And, and I'm not. Um, oh my the, goodness, Bethesda! I'm from the D.C. area. I went. Oh, to you Blair. are. Yeah, I went to Blair. Oh, you went to Blair. Oh man, I wasn't smart enough to go to Blair. I went to Whitman. <laughs> well, I Whitman. Wasn't, nice I wasn't in the magnet. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. <laughs> um, yeah. So. I, uh, I, I grew up there, actually son of entrepreneurs. So my mom is a very successful entrepreneur. She sold two companies uh, in the biochemistry space. She, I think in hindsight, she kind of raised me to be an entrepreneur. I used to earn my allowance by uh, selling sodas to her office. So like I stocked the, the cabinets of the, the snacks and everybody for her employees. That way she could pay me uh, way above market rate and I could earn some cash. And uh, she probably didn't have got tax deductible to give me my allowance in some way. 
Um, so I, I, I think she was kind of grooming me for entrepreneurship. My older brother is also an entrepreneur and my father's a computer programmer. So it's like sort of a family of entrepreneurial types. Um, and my, when I, I went to UC Berkeley for college and when I graduated my, I, it was 2002, like right after the dot-com bubble. And I didn't see a lot of employment prospects. I didn't have a lot of useful skills. First job I got was working for my brother. Now, hold on. I like to spend more time. I want to spend more time in Bethesda. Oh, okay, cool. Back to Montgomery County for a little bit longer. So, uh, so you're growing up um, in suburban Maryland. W what are you into as a kid besides entrepreneurial stuff and selling sodas? Um, you know, I was never a great athlete or anything. I did a, I did a fair amount of work in um, El Salvador, actually. I was, uh, through my church, got involved in uh, this development program. We would, like, send – we built a computer lab – at a, in like rural El Salvador for this like school system that never had internet before. This is like early mid nineties, right? Uh, we, and we are the first computer lab in rural El Salvador, at least in that part of the, um, the country. So I went, I did like a lot of fundraising for that, built all the computers myself, like bought, you know, like kind of created that ship, went down there, brought them down, built, set it up, spent like a summer, IT networking this school in El Salvador. So wow. uh, that was probably like my main hobby. I think honestly, that's how I got into Berkeley is I had like a great essay to talk about all this awesome work that I had done in Central America. Yeah, I mean, you got computers, you got Central America. That's <laughs> that's a, a great essay. And I remember growing up in DC also, you know, 80s, 90s, there was a sense as a young person, people were into stuff, right? It's kind of that political atmosphere where even if it's not, explicitly political you this is pressure to get involved to be passionate about something is that is that part of what's reflected there i think that i think dc is like one of the most global cities in the world you know or like especially bethesda because it's like a lot of these diplomats live there so a lot I, my one of my best friends growing up was the um son of the ambassador of tanzania you know so like i just got like that's kind of cool you get to meet yeah. people like that and i still have never been to tanzania He's, he keeps inviting me back over there but um be able to, you know, kind of connect and be global. Our next door neighbors were Italian diplomats and it's kind of a, just a cool thing to learn, um, be so global. My family always uh, had exchange students living with us. Like my whole life, there was always a foreigner living in the house uh, from oh. the age of about five. I think Why that also that? kind of gave me a global perspective. Wanted me, you know, it's part of how I got involved in El Salvador. I was like, I want to go see the world and be part of this, you know, what these kids have done. Why is that? Why uh, exchange students? That's a pretty conscious choice. Uh, you know what? I got to ask my parents. I haven't asked them why they did that. I think, uh, I, I don't know. I think they wanted a, that experience for us. They wanted us to see that the world's like big and global and get, you know, kind of like really feel, be able to connect with people from other countries. Um, and what was the impact then on you? Did you get to travel besides El Salvador much at the time um, or were you mostly local? Uh, as a kid, I traveled quite a bit. My mom, uh, because she's an entrepreneur and very global uh, purview over her business, would usually take me a couple times a year on one of her business trips. So I went, yeah, dozens of different countries, mostly Europe, but all over the world uh, with my mom to sort of like just ride along. That was that was something really great. What do you remember, you know, locations in Europe wise even from, from that time? Oh, man. So, well, my mom's a food scientist. So she helps companies deal with food regulatory challenges. She did a lot of the, the EU stuff when the EU was first forming to help them determine. I mean, Fran there's so many funny rules about this. Like France, you know, you can only call something champagne if it comes from the Champagne Valley, France. And she's like the world's expert on these things of like what has to be done, what's the specific process to call something that. So we spent like a lot of time on vineyards in France. I remember as a kid, like helping them deal with U.S. regulatory exports. And um, yeah, it's actually kind of interesting how some of it overlaps today because these same rules apply, you know, for export imports, all kinds of stuff. And I've, I've introduced my mom to a handful of clients that are like trying to get expertise on baby formula or how to import something, you know, and she... It's pretty. It's pretty funny when I introduce my mom to a customer. <laughs> she's still running the company. Uh, she's not. She sold the business. Uh, she ran it. It's called um, Exponent, or the the company that bought her company is called Exponent, big publicly traded company. And she ran the food and chemicals division there for like fifteen years after she sold it. Uh, now she she still works a little bit, but she doesn't have any people working for her. She's like kind of a consultant scientist. Amazing. So um, you decide to go to Berkeley. Why? Oh man, I got in. 
which was like a miracle. I know anyone who grew up with me in high school would be very surprised to find out that I got into Berkeley. I wasn't like the best student. You weren't um, either? I wasn't either. <laughs> I, I have um, a hard time paying attention in class. I, I got, I've gotten better as I got older and like more interested in the subjects, but in high school, it was pretty tough for me to pay. I felt like I was kind of trapped there for a long time, to be honest. I was, I was interested and involved, but not necessarily focused on getting A's all the time um you know hard classes and stuff but not not always a so but but you applied to berkeley um you could have gone to maryland um probably applied there too i, I got in there too yeah um i lived in dc though so that was tough like we had to pay for me to go to school in maryland so um you, you went to berkeley to study what uh well when i first got there i didn't know and Berkeley is a big, large institution, as you can imagine, and not a lot of handholding goes on. Like, you need to kind of figure this stuff out on your own at a school that size. It's not a private school. It's a big public school. And so I dabbled. Um, I actually think I might have the record for most credits earned in, in UC Berkeley history. I 170 credits, which I think you graduate with 120. Uh, <laughs> And, and I did summer school every year. As an out-of-state uh, student, you, I, I found this loophole. You don't pay uh, out-of-state tuition on summer school. It's the oh. same price. So instead of getting summer jobs, I just took more class, which was kind of stupid. I didn't need that many credits, but I just like I just took everything. Um, for a long time, I was, gonna, I was claiming that I was going to major in Spanish. Well, actually, I was just taking a lot of Spanish classes so I could go to South America, and that's where I studied abroad in South America. Wow. Um, and when I got back, I was like, I'm not really going to major. A major in Spanish is not like, oh, you're going to keep working on your accent and get more fluent. It's like you're studying Spanish literature, and I got, I wasn't that into it after, you know, I wanted to learn the language. I didn't really care about studying the literature. <laughs> um, so I ended up studying economics, but I remember there was a moment during my second senior year, because I, I stayed five years and did summer school. Uh, I, there was a moment during my second senior year where I was like, I need to graduate. <laughs> this is like, I can't stay here forever. Uh, and so I just did the math. Like, what is the shortest path? Which major should I choose in order to get out of here? And it, at that moment, it was economics. And so I just took like a whole year of economics classes and finally graduated. And, and then went to work for your brother. Exactly. I was, uh, didn't see like I knew what I should do with my life. I didn't see anybody hiring undergrad economists and didn't really know. So my brother had this business importing. He was the first dealer in the United States for a Chinese company called Geely, which is the car company that bought Volvo a few yeah, years ago. Yeah. But at the time, we were not selling their cars. We were selling their motorcycles. And we were buying these motorcycles, selling them on eBay, selling them through live car auctions, our own website, building kind of a brand. And so he hired me to be the jack, jack of all trades, just work for them. I did customer service. I did some motorcycle repairs, which was crazy. Uh, photo, I did all the photo shoots and made our brochures. I did. Uh, how were you, how were you repairing motorcycles? Like, the well, there was a mechanic on the, on the staff. So he would, he would just direct me to do stuff. I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, it, I, I sense, I sense a theme here in figuring stuff out, right? Like you went to Berkeley and it's sort of like, Hey, I want to get a lot of knowledge and just sort of figure it out, figure out what I'm going to do with it. Is that, is that your MO? I think I'm, I'm just a very curious person. I like to learn. That's my number one value. I, I, I don't mind being called a dabbler. Like I'll try a lot of things, be a generalist, learn a lot, learn a little bit about everything is my goal. Um, and I think actually it's a really good strategy that in most disciplines, like a couple of big ideas give you 80% of that discipline. And I think we're, we're often intimidated to go into a new discipline and learn about, but you know, a couple of things you learn it, you're like, okay, I'm, I, I got enough to be dangerous in this discipline. And there's not that many disciplines. There's not an infinite number. Um, so that's something I, I pride myself on is trying to learn a little bit about the biggest ideas in every area of life. Yeah. And so at, at what point um, do you decide to go to business school? Is that right out of working with your brother or is there other stuff in, in between there? Uh, there was something in between. So uh, working for my brother, I saw we were doing so much business with China. All these motorcycles were made in China. We had a couple other product suppliers that were in China. And I, we, this was uh, 2004, 2005. I just saw like, wow, China, 
at that time, it was just obvious, like there's so much opportunity there. And I decided to go to China. Um, I wanted to learn Chinese. I figured I could speak Spanish. I also speak Portuguese. If anybody could learn Chinese, it's me. Turns out not really true, but, I, but I, I did my best. I learned a lot of Chinese. Uh, so I went and, and then go work with these factories, go work with the suppliers, manage logistics. And that's how I got into supply chain was I was in China trying to figure out how do we get these motorcycles out of China back to the U S and just saw like the complete lack of technology from the freight industry, the, uh, the pain of customs and regulations and all the different paperwork. And I felt like these freight forwarders, that's the company you hire to ship stuff. They I just didn't see a level of customer obsession that, uh, that you sort of are used to by now in the technology world and in, uh, in modern companies. And so I, I saw a big opportunity there. Uh, what's interesting though, is that I didn't do anything about the opportunity for another almost a decade. Um, but I saw it, 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 and actually this is a good lesson that I teach people at Flexport is you, I call it uh, schlep blindness, where this is an idea where there's a schlep, which is a Yiddish word for an arduous journey, where there's like a some problem that's so big that your brain is actually blind to the problem because you're like, how could I ever solve that thing? This is an innate feature of human brains is like the biggest problems you just we don't think about death all day because you wouldn't be able to get anything done, right? Uh, so the biggest problems in the world, you sort of, you, you, your conscious brain doesn't want to look at it. And I had that about this logistics problem for almost a decade after I first experienced it. Um, and it was while I was living in China that I decided, you know what? I wasn't making much money. Uh, I wasn't very successful. I was learning a lot. I learned a lot of Chinese. I did see a huge amount of opportunity, but I also had, Felt like I developed a pretty interesting life story that I could use to apply to business school. Um, so I, I applied to business school out of sort of like opportunities to like, hey, you know, at least there's a, a backup plan. If everything else goes wrong in life, I could get a job. Uh, well, it was my once thinking. again, once again, a theme, right? Like as a, as a high school kid, you went to Central America and got an interesting story and got some insights and that led to the next thing. And here you are in China, you know, getting experience. Uh, and, and that ends up leading to the next thing, right? Yeah, yeah. It all makes sense in hindsight, you know. And uh, and and business schools really like to build diverse classes. And I actually came at it from when I got there. I was like, oh, I'm like, I have a very different background than most of these people. I've never been in invest, you know. And it was really cool because you have people who are Olympians and military people uh, on top of your standard, you know, sort of investment banker and McKinsey consultant. There, there was definitely I, I had this like very unique profile of like entrepreneurial experience, international experience, speaking many languages. I never really had a job. Uh, it was like I definitely felt a little out of place, but also felt at home because there were just like lots of other people who were feeling out of place too. Yeah, that um, I, I imagine you would fill that out quite nicely. So you, you weren't making a lot of money in China and you got a, a peak or maybe even more than a peak at a problem that hadn't really turned into a business idea for you quite yet. Um, how did those dots start to connect in business school? Yeah, so actually at, in business school, I thought maybe, hey, maybe I, I went there because I heard business school students make good money and I'm, I wasn't making much money. So I thought maybe I'll go that track and get a job. Uh, I looked around at my fellow classmates and quickly realized I like, uh, I have a lot of great friends there, but I quickly realized like, I'm not cut from the same cloth, like going to get a job didn't seem very attractive. I l did a couple of like recruiting meetings, learning with these companies, what jobs were offered and none of them, they all just seemed like I would be really bad at that job, uh, probably fire me. So I started going back down like, hey, I'm gonna start a company when I graduate. Just like, that's what I know. That seems less risky to me, honestly, than getting one of these jobs where I don't have the right skill set and I'll get fired. Um, so I, I set out to, oh, go ahead. You, you said you weren't making a lot of money um, and, and you went to business school. So how are you gonna start a company? I mean, friends and family, like how's this gonna be funded? How's that gonna work? Oh, totally. Well, I, um, what I did, I, I don't think you need a lot of money to start a company. You know, you just need to do something useful for somebody else. And um, I, I, I did a couple of things. First, I got a job, part-time job, writing uh, case studies for Columbia Business School. So that's where I went to business school. Uh, case studies is how like modern businesses classes are taught. 
where you everybody reads a case and a and then a well written case. It's sort of like a scenario with some analytics, like you got to do some math, you got to do some financial modeling and help a, the protagonist of the case make a decision. What should they do? Um, and what what's happened is Af business schools in Africa have started to adopt the case method, but there's no business school cases written about African companies. And so I wrote the first ever business school case about an African company uh, called Computer Warehouse Group. Uh, CWG, which is an IT publicly traded company on the Nigerian stock exchange, and I wrote, uh, went to Africa. I went to Africa, interviewed the founders. So I got this like cool part-time job uh, working for for the school, so I could make some money, keep my life experience going, keep learning. Um, that was my first trip to Africa, and and then I got another job. Oh, uh, doing consulting for helping businesses with their website. This wasn't a job actually. This was just me making money. Uh, helping companies like market their website appear higher in search engine rankings. I used to be good at that. And so it's just like created some side streams of income that also gave me space to work on like, okay, what's my real business idea? Uh, that way I could pay my rent, pay down my student loans, make enough money to, but I never needed a lot of money. One thing that um, taught, I, I learned spending time in El Salvador as a teenager, studying abroad in South America and college, living in China, like you could live pretty cheaply in this world. Um, when I lived in China, my rent was 120 bucks a month and I had a two bedroom apartment. So I was like, you know, worst case as an entrepreneur that gave me permission to like go try things. I'd never worried that much about failure because worst case I'll, I go back to China and find an apartment and I'll, I'll be okay. I, I lived in China for a year where I only made $17,000 and I saved money that year. What's the secret? What's the secret to- uh, Don't spend money. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't acquire expensive habits um yeah i mean that's it like uh just just go for the minimum viable living situation I, I i think you know the problem that i see a lot of with my uh fellow classmates who are going to school is just student debt and people taking on money that's so you know it, debt is just crippling and i found it that way too like it definitely narrowed my range of choices i would have been able to live even cheaper and not had to do some of these things like the um, internet marketing consulting stuff that I was doing if I didn't have to make these debt payments. Um, so if I can go back in time, honestly, I, I'm lucky that I managed. The first thing I did as I started to make some money was pay down that student debt. Um, but that, that can be pretty crippling and stop you. But if you don't have these sort of like outlays, live cheaply, you don't need to live in the expensive, fancy part of Manhattan or something, right? Like how do you, yeah, I think that that that's my um, mantra with entrepreneurs is like you shouldn't be out there waiting for permission from investors to go do your thing. Like the investors, I didn't raise my first venture capital till I'd been doing startups for 15 years before I raised a dollar of venture capital. Huh. OK, so <laughs> tell, tell me about that. Import Genius, right, is the first is the first stab at this. How did that come together? Yeah, so Import Gene is the one that I started while I was in business school with my, again, with my brother and his business partner, Michael Kanko. So those are the guys that have this uh, motorcycle company that I was working for before business school. And Import Genius came about because we learned, we realized whenever you ship something by ocean, which we were doing a lot of, the shipping manifest is a public record in the United States. And there was nobody doing a good job collecting all this data, digitizing it, making it searchable and accessible. And it's incredibly rich, valuable data that shows you like every company in the US, what are they buying? Where are they buying it from? Which companies do they, uh, where do they source their products from? And we started using the data to identify new suppliers for parts and new products that we could sell, uh, motorsports products. And we were like, wait a minute, this actually, this data is more interesting than our motorcycle company. Uh, and so we built a search engine for it that, and that became Import Genius. Um, Import Genius now has something like 450 million of these shipping manifests digitized across 15 different countries. Uh, and we sell subscriptions to the database. So I ran that business as CEO from like 2007 while I was still in school until the day I started Flexport uh, some number, you know, back in 2013. And so tell me about that transition then from Import Genius to Flexport and sort of what the big idea was at the time and why you knew that was the one. 
Yeah, it's, um, so I, Flexport came about the idea with my older brother, David. We were just going on long walks talking about opportunities and where we could take. Like, Importina is a great business, but there's only a limited market for the shipping data. And it's, I don't know, I never really got into, like, the idea of building it into this amazing quant strategy for selling to Wall Street or something. We sold it to people like us who were sourcing products in China and wanted better tools for that. Um, we never like figured out how to crack into the quant market, which was this, the advice that everyone ever gave me about that company was like, don't waste your time with these importers, go sell to Wall Street. And they're probably right, but I never did that. Um, uh, but what we were more thinking was like, what are the tools that you would need as an importer, as a brand participating in global trade to make it awesome. And we just kept coming back to this idea that, wow, these customs brokers and freight forwarders seem that there's no tech and they just seem like not really up with it in terms of customer service, customer experience, customer obsession, and the technology that would go into that. And so there was just a very clear outline of an idea, but it, it took a while. Um, we first had those conversations in right at the start when we were first starting in Port Genius. And I, I found my first business plan for Flexport in 2008. Um, wow. and I didn't hire a single employee to do it or raise any money until 2013. So it was a, you know, a long time of iterating, uh, learning and getting licensed, had to pass an FBI background check to be a customs broker, um, had to go, you know, through a lot of tests to be able to understand how the government, all the regulations work and things like that. So it's, it's a long time to get started. And I, I, another lesson for entrepreneurs, right. is like, if you can structure your life. So you're not spending lots of money, then you don't, and you don't have any debt, hopefully, then you don't need to raise a lot of venture capital and you don't need to go begging for permission from investors to please invest in me, you know, and, and, and counterintuitively, like investors only invest in you when they, when you don't need the money. Like when you, when it's like, oh, this guy's going to succeed with or without my money, I better, I better get in here. And so like, we were able to kind of like make that true to an extent. Um, at what point does it become clear that you are succeeding? Yeah, you know, Flexport had this crazy product market fit almost from the start. Um, like we launched our website and people just started signing up. Like hundreds of companies were signing up. We, we had uh, Foxconn sign up one day. This is before we were like, had raised any money or had any employees. It was just me and a website. And Foxconn makes the iPhone. They like sign up for the site. And I'm like, oh my goodness. Like I thought I was making a tool for people like me that are like eBay sellers and Amazon merchants and stuff. And then all of a sudden the biggest companies in the world sign up. Saudi Aramco, the national oil company of Saudi Arabia signed up. I didn't have any employees. I'm like, I don't think I'm ready for this customer. How, yeah. How are you able to make this work? I mean, AWS, it took a while to become big, but I guess maybe, well, maybe now it's 2013. So it's big already. It's a good thing you didn't try to start this earlier. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? Like the reality is we didn't close, like I wasn't ready for their business. I didn't sign up their business, but it was it was very clear there's something here, you know? Um, and we had lots of small businesses signing up and, and very quickly we realized, hey, we can grow as fast as we want. The, the limit on growth is our capabilities. What can we actually do? Can we serve these customers? Can we make them happy? Can we build the technology? Uh, and, and honestly, that's still the truth. That's still true today. We're just in a mad scramble to keep up with demand. We're now, we, our first ever revenue for Flexport was in 2014. Um, we did $112 million in revenue last month. Wow. Last month. Uh, and, and, oh yeah. And it's going to keep growing by the end of the year. We'll be above, I mean, who knows? Prices are going up too. Um, so it, it, we, we're now the, one of the largest freight providers in the United States and just in five, six years of uh, crazy trying to keep up with the demand from customers. Wow. So um, I, I like to ask about uh, everybody's death valley, your lowest point um, that, you know, maybe almost broke you that, uh, you know, you thought maybe whatever plan you had for that period might have to be scrapped and you, and you might have to just do something completely different either in career or in life. Do you, do you have a moment like that? Yeah. You know, there've been a couple on a, on a personal level. Um, I think the most important thing to me was I, my second year living in China right at the start of my second year. So right after I finished one year in China and 
I remember distinctly, I had been drinking too much, partying too much. And I remember one night I was in a nightclub in Shanghai and I looked around and there were no Chinese people in this nightclub. And I was like, oh, why am I here? Well, I was like, I came to China to learn Chinese, to like get involved in supply chain. And all of a sudden I'm like just partying with a bunch of Europeans and Americans in a foreign country. I was like, this is not what I signed up for. Uh, and I had some like deep soul searching to do. Ended up quitting drinking alcohol. I moved to like a very remote part of China where I could like really immerse myself in the culture uh, and and really change my life, honestly. Like try to get focused on what I want from life. What are my real values here? So it's kind of like a low point that I that I definitely I used it to to drive some positivity. From a from a business standpoint, um, you know, we might be one of these low points right now. We're, we're Flexport, the global logistics industry is just like in a crisis where we can't get enough space to satisfy our customers. The, the ships are full, customers are frustrated, and it, it's a real challenge right now to get to solve for our customers' needs. And it's, it's super painful because we're a very customer-focused company, and it's pretty hard to be like, these brands depend on us. You know, if they can't get that space, they might go out of business. Um, hmm. And and so it's it's also an amazing moment at Flexport. Like we're using it to, there's no one who at Flexport right now who's like, our job doesn't matter. I'm just doing mindless stuff. Like nobody has that feeling because we're like, man, we're trying to save our customers' businesses. We're trying to find solutions that enable them to grow in the midst of what's really a huge disruption of their supply chain. I mean, we've been in that kind of like, wartime mode for a couple of years, honestly. Uh, we're we're kind of battle tested because remember we had, uh, well, when we first started, there was a port strike and that was 2015 and like you couldn't ship anything on the West Coast. And then 2016, you had a collapse in the price of ocean freight to, to the lowest levels in history, 400, 500 bucks. What's now 10,000 was 500 in 2016. 17, 18, 19, you had Trump throwing out new tariffs every month that was disrupting everything. And then 2020, COVID hit and we had to ship, we got active in shipping PPE to the world's hospitals and it was full on wartime mode here to try to solve that problem. And today it's like right back to our core business. How do we help our customers? So we're used to it, but it doesn't make it easy. And it's, it's definitely, um, it, can, it, can, it can get to you if you're not careful and make sure people are taking care of each other and knowing why we're doing the things we're doing, why we're working so hard. Now, first I want to deal with the, with the business one because normally when I talk to entrepreneurs and CEOs about the lowest business points, it's when they almost go out of business. Mm. It's not when they're making money hand over fist. So, um, but, your, but your customers are having a difficult time. Uh, I, I'm, I'm caught between thinking that's fascinating and not believing you, but I kind of am leaning toward believing you and that being difficult because yeah. of what you said about customer focus and because as a high school kid, you were, you were in uh, Central America helping to put computer labs together. So uh, tell me about the, the emotional complexity so, in seeing a successful business that's helping struggling customers. So totally, and, and here's the thing. When I used to sell motorcycles, when we didn't have spare parts, customers would yell at me. It was the worst, most disempowering thing that ever happened, right? You're just like, I can't, I'm sorry, I don't have a part. Like every month, maybe I'll never get this part. Like I'm, I sold you that motorcycle last month and now you're pissed at me and there's nothing I can do. And like, I know that those conversations are happening with our team right now, where it's like, we can't deliver on promises that we've made at times. And that's just like terrible. It's toxic, honestly. And, and the thing that we're working so hard on right now is being real with our customers about what's possible, what's not possible, what's likely to go wrong. You know, I mean, the analogy I've been using with our teams is sort of like, hey, if, if you hire, if you're planning a wedding and it's an outdoor wedding and it rains, you only get mad at the wedding planner if they never brought up the possibility of rain and didn't make any options for you about what we're gonna do if it rains. Now, maybe there's nothing you can do except give everybody an umbrella because you know the backup plan is too expensive and you can't afford it. And the backup plan in this case is air freight or it's like paying a 
ton of extra money to guarantee yourself space, but maybe you can't afford it. And so you're stuck in the rain with an umbrella. That's okay. You don't need to get mad at our team if that happens, as long as we're upfront with you ahead of time about the reality of the situation. But if we don't do that, then you have a right to be mad at us. And I think we haven't always been top notch over the last couple, over the last year. It's been hard to predict these things. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, it's hard to have difficult conversations and we got to train people to do that. So that, that's very real. That's a problem. Now, and that's the emotional side of business that we're definitely going through as a company. And we, we care about our customers. So like, it's one of the cool things about Flexport is we're sort of the circulatory system for all these companies. We get to see how they operate, get to know the people, you know, like help them grow. And so when, when we fail on them, it's like, man, that sucks. Like we thought we were helping you and all of a sudden you're mad at me. Um, but actually there's a strategic side here too, which is, look, I can't grow. And we're, we want to be the biggest. We want to have the biggest market share. We want to grow the fastest. And we had to turn away a hundred thousand containers worth of volume over the last 90 days that customers want to ship with us for context. We're doing like 600,000 a year is our current run rate. That's like considerable growth and market share that we'd like to have. And if the ship is full, then that ocean carrier who owns the ship has to make a choice who gets the container us or our competitor. And, you know, I like to think they like us the most. We try to be their carrier friendly. That's a big part of our strategy. But the reality is our competitors have been around for much longer than us. They've been playing golf with these carriers. They've been building long-term relationships and we're the new guys. And so it's when the ship is not full, even though prices will be lower, we might make less money, but we can grow. They're happy to give us that space. But when the ship is full, all of a sudden I'm in a much more like rivalry, compete, competitive environment. And uh, I, I'd much rather, you know, prices be cheaper. Everybody can ship more stuff and we can grow as fast as we want. And we're not in that condition right now. Okay. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Now take me back to the China moment when you realize your priorities are out of whack. And, you know, I, I want to go there for the core belief, oftentimes these really tough death valley type moments, whatever gets you through that becomes a tool in your toolbox that you use again and again after that. So was that the case for you there? What is it exactly that you got out of that moment that maybe you still carry with you? Uh, I'll be real with you. My, I, I was having a tough time. I talked to my dad about it and he sent me in China a book uh, by Tony Robbins called uh, Awaken the Giant Within. And books are like, at that time, pretty scarce English books in China. Like it was hard for me to find books. I read that book a few times. It has a lot of like exercises and stuff. And I honestly, I just went deep with Tony, I found his videos online. Uh, I've since gotten to know Tony Robbins in person. So, or at least on Zoom. Uh, so I, um, I'm, I'm like, I'm not embarrassed to talk about this because I think he's been a really powerful set of messages, but one of them was like, really go deep in understanding what your core values are and sort of like figure out if there's a problem because you can change your core values if you want to. Hmm. And what I realized was up until that point in my life, my number one value was adventure. You know, I sort of described this a little bit. Like I was like, and that, that's cool. It was fun. I learned so much and I still like some adventure. I like to go out and see what's going on in the world. I, been part of some really cool, I've learned so much from that, but it's not leading to like a lot of stability. It's not making you the most reliable person in the world. It's not. And, and so I really got deep with myself. I'm like, what do I, what do I want to value in life? And I made a conscious decision that I was going to put learning as my number one value. And now I've, I've since had, I've gotten married, have a kid. So now I put love number one, but uh, I have to say that my wife's watching out there, but uh <laughs> But learning for a long time, I really elevated that and said, look, I'm going to make this my number one thing in life um, and I and health, right? And I quit drinking and I um, made some just better life decisions. But it was a conscious effort. And, and sometimes you have to hit a low before you can make yourself be like, you know what? Something has to change. I was feeling a lot of pain, some borderline depression. I'm sure some of it was from like not having a lot of friends. I'm in a foreign country where I'm not that good at the local language and stuff. But uh Definitely, I, I use that for me. And I think, um, yeah, it's a good life lesson for folks. That is fascinating. Uh, I've never heard that articulated in quite that way. And it makes me wonder, uh, businesses get talked about as having core values too. Uh, do you ever have to, have you ever had to change a business's core values? 
Oh, we have. Yeah. You know, so um, we had, we have set a core values and we retired one of them um, or and we replaced a couple, but one we flat out retired. We used to have the value at Flexport called fill the gap, uh, which is a, actually it's a great startup value. It's just like, Hey, don't worry that much about whose job is what, like you, if there's a problem, jump in there and take it. Um, and that's a great startup early stage value. But when you got bigger, what we saw was like, Lots of people filling the same gap at the same time. <laughs> it became like mobbing the soccer ball. There was a, yeah, totally. And then wait, you fill that gap, but you still have a day job. So now you're overworked or you're leaving your day job behind because you're focused on this gap. And honestly, if Boeing had the core value of fill the gap, I'd be like, I don't know if I want to fly on these planes. <laughs> like there shouldn't be any gaps. Right? <laughs> uh, and so I, I think as we matured, we sort of said, Hey, this is a, Kind of a startup value that we that's causing us more problems than it's solving at this stage. We retired yeah, it. That, uh, that makes a lot of sense. So, um, wow, uh, where do you go from here? You talked about the challenge in logistics right now, and sort of you hope that things normalize a bit, uh, even if that that means, in in a sense, um, lower lower pay, lower revenue. Um, but the supply demand balance would be better. Um, trajectory here, are you thinking uh, IPO or some other, what's what's the next uh, kind of stage for Flexport? Yeah, um, I think financially we're ready to be a public company. Like our metrics are good enough to be public, we're profitable. Um, but I, I do worry a lot about these market conditions. And as long as there's this sort of governor on our growth, which is the lack of capacity and as you mentioned, like prices are going to come down. I don't know when I can't make those predictions, but you can't keep prices at this level. Like it, things will give. Um, and that'll mean our revenue actually goes down when that happens. And I think that's probably a better thing to do as a private company. Go through like, you know, you want to come out when we go public and be like, we're a growth stock. We're going to be something that companies can get investors can get behind and it's going to be all up and to the right from here. Uh, and like, if you know your revenue is going to go down, maybe better to do that in private where you can sit with investors and spend more time explaining like, actually it's good for us that prices are coming down. It means that the capacity is unblocking. We can grow faster, like strategically, we're, we're in a battle for market share and here's what this means for us and like all the benefits. Very hard to do in a public market environment where you're just primarily judged on your P&L. And I don't think Flexport's P&L tells the full story. So we've got, and, and that's probably always true. We got to really work on cultivating a long-term shareholder base. And I want to get our current investors like totally in love with the company so that nobody wants to sell even when we go public. Uh, so I got a number of things I want to do internally. Um, our also, also our board is still like, we're not, we don't have public ready board. It's still just a small group of people. I like it small when you're private, we make decisions and move faster, but you go public, you want to put a little bit more governance in. So I think we'll, we'll go public in the next few years, but we're not in a big rush. Hmm. Well, that gives a really good picture of all the factors and things that you're considering, which, hey, that's a theme. Um, there, there's a lot to consider uh, in, in global logistics and in technology, and you've given, uh, you've given me a really great look at that, so I appreciate it. Uh, my pleasure, my pleasure, it's really great. Ryan Peterson, Flexport CEO, thank you.